Hi, this is uh, Jay Harwood's latest edition of Amazing Conversations with Brendan McKean, the Executive Director of Mets End Games Operations, which means this is all your baby here. This is my baby. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's tech haven in here. I like it to you to a GM who signed a top free agent on the market. So the scoreboard, 1,790 square feet, three times larger than we had last year. How does it make you feel? I mean, it makes me feel great that we have this, like, amazing canvas that we can... Right. You know, do our show on, show our amazing, like we have an amazing content team here. So like our amazing content that we could put up there. It's also, you know, a lot of pressure. There's a lot of eyes on that. So, uh, you know, with the good also comes the pressure of making sure that you execute every game, just like, a, you know, a free agent or a right. GM that, um, you know, all the eyes are on you. So, you know, better make it good. So I understand you, you lead like over 50 people. The football team is 53 people. <laughs> A basketball team is about 20 people. A hockey team is less. That's a, that's a, a huge army all under your wing here. Well, I'm not Bill Belichick, but... Um, no. Or... or uh, Brian Davo, as we say, maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a Jets fan, so Robert Sala for me. Yes. But, um, yeah, we have, a, you know, we have a big staff. Like, you know, people like the joke sometimes on the internet. It's like, oh, the intern running the scoreboard. Yeah. And it's like... Like, no, we're a major company with a... You know, we're a major entertainment operation, if you think about it. Like... Not only the scoreboard show, but uh, all the stuff we do pregame on the field. Um, the the Perk Patrol, who are essentially our brand ambassadors, you know, throwing T-shirts out. The mascots, Mr. and Mrs. Met. Like, yeah, it's a it's a it's an operation, and we have a great team here that executes it. I feel like I'm sitting in Houston in NASA. What is all this stuff here? I mean, we're not. I mean, well, I mean, a lot of it's screens, right? So you yeah. have a ton of screens, um, video feeds, cameras, video playback, all. Uh, graphics in front of me over here like there's a lot of tech in here and you know we kind of make it all work together to formulate you know a show for four hours 81 times a year you know plus soccer games plus soccer i mean plus yeah soccer. plus soccer games plus. nycfc um plays six games here this year i would not be surprised if that number increases in the future but yeah and we have to execute their live show as well and they they come in and they expect to be the best in the business and that's what we have to deliver for them as well when Scorbert gave birth, when did you know it was going to happen I, like this? Like this? Yeah. I think I found out about the, the big, big board in, uh, in 2021 um, after the pandemic, after the ownership change had yeah. happened when Steve and Alex bought the, bought right. the team. Um, this room was always scheduled to be upgraded. COVID happened. Um, obviously, there's no fans in the building, so it doesn't make a lot of financial sense to be spending a lot of money right. on on a scoreboard control room, so it got pushed back a year. Uh, the ownership changed over, and then the scope of the project changed significantly. So, you know, this room got built as part of phase one, uh, knowing that we were gonna get the big board the next year as part of phase two. So it was really a two-year process um, where we could get comfortable in a brand new control room with all new tech that right. really was state-of-the-art. Uh, and then, you know, the big canvas, the big centerpiece, I guess, if you will, uh, in place a year later. Did you have to go to school, Brendan? I mean, how did you learn about what I to did. do? Like, uh, like uh, many of my media brethren, I went to Syracuse University. Right. So, um, you, you, you disappointed Bam retired? Uh, I don't know if I should be talking about that on a, on a podcast <laughs> okay. here. Uh, but he did, um, you know, he did bring me a lot of uh, good years as a Syracuse right, basketball yeah. fan. But, um, yeah, I mean, at school, I studied television, radio, film. Um, the big thing for me was I wasn't in any fraternity or anything. I, I joined the student TV station, mm -hmm. which was Hill TV at the time, uh, became Citrus TV, and that was my fraternity. I lived there. I produced live sports shows from there. It was all student-run. We had no professors helping us, so you really learned how to use all... It wasn't this equipment, let's be honest. It's a right. student-run TV station, but you really learn how to make things work on a bare bones budget and you really know how to make TV and you learn on the fly in the moment, you know, with, with real stakes. It was, it was airing locally in Syracuse. I mean, how did you prepare for this? Did you, did you go to Samsung University? No, well, I mean, it, this is all a huge learning curve. Um, you know, there's, there's big uh, stakes in terms of like, you know, when we come in, like you think you know what you're doing in terms of like the control room in a world where like high definition HD is the standard. And then you move to like the next level, which is, you know, UHD 4K. And then um, essentially like you're controlling like the entire stadium from like 
one button push over there on the switcher. And, you know, it's little steps along the way. Like you, you build your knowledge in terms of like, okay, I know how to do this. I know how to do this. And then you learn a way to bridge those two things. And you're like, oh, now I can do this and this with this. And you just kind of take little steps up, like almost like a pyramid like that. Let me go back to Leah's here first. You, know, you guys did a great job with Timmy Trumpets. Why were you nervous about that? You, you said, quote, to say, see you on the other side. Well, I yeah. mean, and it worked out great. But what was your so, nerve uh, capacity? Yeah, like the, essentially right before it happened, because Timmy Trumpet was here the night before. We were playing the Dodgers. Right. And... Edwin didn't get in the game. Right. I, I think um, I think that was the one game we lost out of the three to the Dodgers because we beat them two out of three. And he decided to stay the next game. And it's just all this pressure being built up of like, you know, is this is this moment going to happen? Obviously, our manager, Buck Showalter, is not going to manage to the situation of having Timmy Trumpet perform. He's not? No, he's not. Obviously, I don't think he's he going to. No? But um, the game was incredible. Brandon Nimmo makes a catch over the wall right. with Jacob deGrom on the mound. And then a one-run game against the Dodgers, who are on pace to set a wins record for the National League. You know, Edwin Diaz is about to come out with a live performance from Timmy Trumpet. And I just remember on the headset being like, well, this is going to happen. And let's just do this. See you guys on the other side. I've been around a long time. Probably the top walk-off, you know, walk-off movie, whatever you want to call it, any, you know, it, People get excited about it. Your time here, is anything close to Timmy Trumpet? I am of the era where I grew up with uh, with Billy Wagner yeah. and, Enter uh, Sandman. and Enter Sandman and the whole argument of uh, with the team across where, the Bronx about right. ownership of that song. But uh, that was a moment when Billy would come in. I remember opening being here opening day 2006, yeah. his first game, and uh, the place really lit up when that song hit. And but I think Edwin and. Like, it's all Edwin, right? Like, Edwin had an historic season. Right. So him coming in and just being lights out and striking out people at the rate he did, like, it doesn't take off without that. So, you know, all the credit to Edwin Diaz in terms of, like, making that work because... He got it, too, right? He got the whole... Oh, he, like, this is... Like, at the end of the day, like, this is, this is entertainment. And, like, he understood that when he's on the mound, obviously, he's going to perform and he's going to pitch. But... Otherwise, like to draw eyeballs, and you know he reaped the benefits of it as well in terms of like uh, the, the attention contract. his he got, and also financially the contract he got. Yeah, but uh, he understood it as well. Like I, w I remember being told one time that he would time his walk out of the bullpen to us playing the song. Really, that's great. Yeah, so that when he stepped out of the bullpen, the song would hit, and then he would time his okay. jog in at a certain time. So. He really understood the uh, that part of it. The you know the people are watching for entertainment factor. How has the clock affected what you do up here? It's actually a huge adjustment. I remember the first game, our home opener uh, against the Marlins. Uh, the first three innings, my head was spinning, and it was like, okay, I I can't show two angles of a replay and then show the next batter coming up because oh my god, he's in the box and we're about to cause a pitch clock violation because we're not you know steady on the board. The, Major League rules state that all moving video animations have to be static for when play starts. It's distracting to the players. Right. So that was a real adjustment uh, in between batters in terms of like getting to the next batter in time while also showing the fans what they want to see, which are you know replays of you know the double that Alonso just hit or the home run that Jeff McNeil right. just hit. So it really was an adjustment on the fly because uh, in spring training everyone was kind of viewing and seeing it like as they were testing it and making adjustments and then you know for us at least the live in-game show the, the that first day was a whirlwind what, what rules are you bounded by with the replays that when, when it meant the manager's mm -hmm. challenge you bounded what you could show and not yep. could show yeah so major league baseball sets rules on what we are allowed and not allowed to show um your ho-hum f7 fly out to the left fielder right. have at it show whatever you want we used to not be able to show double plays because of the neighborhood play at second base where, right. you know, the second baseman was given a little leeway in turn, or second baseman or shortstop were giving a little bit of leeway on touching the bag to avoid injury. Since they changed that rule uh, with, the, uh, you know, protecting the, the, the fielders with the base running and the sliding rules, uh, we are allowed to show double plays now. Any controversial or, like, uh, like close play, we're allowed to show it one time at full speed and... You know, I have to use my own judgment on that. Like, if it's a play where 
I think it's going to give the opposing manager a free look at a play that might cause them to challenge and right. for the Mets to, you know, be on the losing side of that. I have to, you know, I have to weigh that as well. I don't want to give the opposing manager an advantage that he that that person would not normally sure, have. Sure. So we are definitely bounded by rules. Once they go to replay, once the umpires state that there's been a challenge made, uh, we're allowed to show whatever we want. We have to make sure that the, the fans are being shown what the umpires are seeing so that when the call is made, they understand why it was made. But how much is the winning and losing the team affect what you do up here? A lot, little, nothing? It affects it. It definitely does. Um, a winning team definitely has more fun. <laughs> um, nobody wants to see um, goofiness on the scoreboard when the team is losing right. 7 nothing in the fourth inning. I'll say the vibe in the ballpark yeah. definitely is palpable based on the team performance. And thankfully, the last few years, the Mets have been right. really good. So we've had a lot of fun. You take a lot of planning to set you build in the spring with the players. Like was last year, you had a New York theme through with delis. Yep. I mean, is you is, how long do you think that out before what you do? I mean, what food? What was the theme this year? So the theme this year, and I I have to give all the credit in the world to uh, you know Jake Smith, Bobby Clemens, who head up our content team. The inspiration was really uh, a Jay Z music video from about 15 years ago. Um, so that was kind of the inspiration for it, and. You know, while last year we had a lot of neon, dirty, gritty kind of look, mm -hmm. this year I think we kind of wanted to go a complete 180 from that. So, dark, uh, you know, white, a lot of white in the look. So um, an LED screen that kind of just silhouetted a guy out like in pure white. Um, and then also just like clean. That was the whole thing. And then we, uh, we used the, um, the Shea Bridge uh, architecture and the uh, light trusses architecture as kind of inspiration for other elements in it. What's the best thing you added this year to, I mean, concert-wise, you think? Well, we kind of changed up a little bit um, in the eighth inning. It was traditionally just, you know, we would play Piano Man and people would sing along. We decided that um, we wanted to kind of like change up the music, give a little more variety to it. So we kind of rebranded it as eighth inning karaoke, you know, rolled out a live poll so people can choose. And when we try to, when we select the songs for that, we try to do kind of a, a song from different eras. So like a song from the seventies, right. maybe a song from the eighties and then more, a more modern song and let people vote on it. And uh, that's kind of been the big change from previous years. And while, you know, Piano Man will still make its appearances, yeah. especially on Saturday, it's right. nine o'clock on a Saturday. So got to play Piano Man. But uh We've kind of changed it up in terms of like eighth inning music. Do you have a pep talk before a game when all your guys, I mean, you gather everybody together a certain point, or maybe a week or two or, or? So before the season, we'll do rehearsals and we'll right. give like a, a big speech beforehand mm -hmm. about, you know, coming back and everyone, you know, being welcomed back. But, you know, we play 81 games. We do 81 shows a year. So, you know, on a Tuesday night against someone that isn't the Dodgers or the Braves, um, everyone kind of knows how to do their job. You know, everyone kind of gets the rundown of what we're doing. And, uh, you know, we just kind of go. We, we, we know the show at that point. So, but, you know, bigger moments, especially like playoffs or like the Dodgers series that we talked about earlier. Yeah, like we'll give a little pep talk like, hey, there's going to be 43,000 people here tonight. So let's all be on our game and put on a good show. Person question. If you have another senator, are you going to name the kid City? <laughs> no, well... No? No. But you no. have a son named Shay. I have a son named no, Shay. Um, City McKee doesn't work it for you? It doesn't really. I don't. It doesn't roll off How the about tongue. Paul grabs no, me. no, Shay works because it's a nice Irish name as well. You so. and David Wright. Chipper Jones is his name. Is, is I know. It. Yeah, well, well Chipper, Chipper did it in a more trolling fashion. Yes. I appreciate more that yeah. how David handled it. But your, your history with the is back a long way. You met your wife. Yeah. And, so, and, and, and Shay Stadium. Yep. So, with a blind date, a regular date? No. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was a production assistant. Um, she was an intern at the time, right. so I was 23. She was 22. After her internship ended, we we kept in touch because we you know we got along pretty well, and that was kind of how we you know we met at Shea Stadium. It's last year, and kind of kept in touch after her internship ended and she graduated, started dating, and you know got married six years later. So yeah, you you really started at the bottom of the know why? Because you actually worked for me. I did. I mean, that's really the bottom rung, Bernard. I know. Well, you, 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 you cut VNRs for me back in, you know, nine or something like yeah, that. Yeah, my, so I was a production assistant, but I wasn't full time yet right. with the Mets. I worked for the Brooklyn Cyclones and there was a symbiotic relationship there where uh, I would come help out right. at Shea Stadium and the, the Mets crew would come and help out in Brooklyn when we needed it. Um, but I got hired full time with the Mets in February of 2009 and my first assignment was 
doing the video news releases in Port St. Lucie yeah. for Jay Horowitz, which, in, which entailed uh, basically uh, stalking a player for right. a day. Um, you know, you would tell us that we're covering Jose Reyes that yeah. day, and it's like, all right, Jose, we're going to follow you everywhere you go, yeah. and then we're going to interview at the end of the day, and then we're going to send those clips back to the news. And, you know, that's how Channel 4, Channel 7, and Channel 2 would have their Mets news clip that night. That's so. probably the best thing we did, to be honest with you, because, you know, St. Lucie is 45, 50 minutes from West Palm. You know, and we, to get to, we, we were, the only problem is that the networks somebody didn't come because they knew that we'd get our news releases. Yeah. So that's the only dichotomy of that. Yeah, but, I mean, at the same time, like, there was Mets content on the news every yeah. night from basically the day after the Super Bowl ended until, you know, the day of our first spring training game. And, like, I don't know the numbers. I'm not, uh, I'm not the finance yeah. guy. I'm not the media relations guy. But that's got to be good for the brand, I think. No, it's great. I mean, and you've got your, your, your brother was a Mets fan? My older brother, uh, my, you know, my father wasn't really a big sports fan. Um, but my older brother had the 1986... Uh, year to remember VHS tape, the one is that, that with the Bob has the guys going like that. Yeah, the one that we, the one they played on the scoreboard at Shea yeah, Stadium yeah. every rain delay. Yeah. Um, and I was born in 1985, so right. the '86 Mets. I have no personal memory of them. I yeah. was less than I was a year old. And they gave me Audrey sometimes. I've heard some, some stories. Sometimes they did give me Audrey, <laughs> the good kind of Audrey though. Good I've seen touch. the clip of you when Mookie Wilson's coming in after uh, after the Buckner ball yeah. in the locker room, but. Um, yeah, I wore out that VHS tape, that 1986 yeah. World. No, it wasn't even the World. It was the whole season highlight video. SNY would call it um, yearbook, I guess. Yeah. But um, I wore that thing out, and that's how I became a Mets fan. You, you told this. I know your story, which I can relate to. I grew up as a Giant fan. And when the Giants were uh, got into the World Series in 62, I was in my, in my biology care class. And I screamed out, the Giants go to the World Series. You, I know you would when Andy made the catch. Yeah. So uh, I was a television radio film major in college. Uh, I interned in 06 with the Mets, but I had to go back to school for my senior year. So I wasn't here for the playoffs. On Thursday nights, I was in a, um, a sitcom production class where we would like produce our own like multicam sitcom. Think Seinfeld, think Friends, that kind of show. And Thursday nights was always our set building night. So we would be there from like seven to midnight, building sets to shoot the next day on. Game seven against the Cardinals that year was a Thursday night. So I convinced my TA to get a TV to bring into the studio while we built sets. And, you know, followed along with every pitch and then screamed when Andy made the catch and startled every one of my classmates who were like on ladders trying I to paint sets. About 40 years earlier or 50 years earlier. Yeah. And then uh, I stayed late that night because we had wrapped up by, you know, and by the time the game had gone into extras. So I stayed late uh, and watched uh, watched the end there kind of uh, with one other Mets fan. Um, but yeah. What's the thing I admire about your career? You really started at bottom. You worked your behind off to get to where you were. It's got to be proud of what you've done from an intern in Brooklyn to running this whole project here. I am extremely proud. I, I mean, the people, you know, that kind of mentored me along the way, I can't think enough. Like, I'm going to drop some names, but like Vito Vidiello and Tim Gunkel, like, you know, they really like recognized the potential and were able to help me grow. And, you know, without them, um, I really wouldn't have got the experience I got. Like even today, I think we foster this environment, but especially back then, like when you, you might've had a, a title of like associate producer, right. but you were really involved in everything. Right. Like right. you would be involved in creating the graphics for the scoreboard show. If, when we needed to shoot the Professor Reyes segment. I don't know if you remember I'm that. I'm sure, sure I do. Um, you'd be the person with the camera going to find fans during pregame, trying to have them pronounce biblioteca or whatever Spanish word yeah, Jose was yeah, trying to teach yeah. you that night. So you really, you know, you got your feet wet on a lot of different projects and that really helped, you know, widen your skill set. Well, you, you paid your dues and now you're reaping the benefits of that. Is there anything one going forward you hope to do at the end of the year, anything to introduce or you know, play it by year, you know. Going yeah, forward. I mean, the the lead up to the season is such a um, condensed time period, especially like all the construction that happened around the ballpark. The, the video board really wasn't turned on until about two weeks before opening day. Right. So, you know, we had to do a lot of our pre-production in those two weeks before, which were a whirlwind, but, you know, you have to prioritize in terms of like, okay, we have to get this done. And then we'll get to this other fun stuff like down the line. So I look forward to rolling out like 
some more of our advanced stat features down the line, a couple more um, uh, content ideas that we have that will hopefully come to fruition. Um, but yeah, we, we build the show throughout the year. It's not the same show on August 31st as it is on April 6th. Kip, I've known you almost 20 years now. I know. I'm old. You're getting older too. Now I you'll, know. You'll catch me up though, Brendan. Oh, I know. It's, it goes by fast yeah. and yeah. Great it job. really does. Best luck with everything. Appreciate it, Jay. Thanks, Brendan. Appreciate Thanks, it. Man.